The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. So the question is, are we going to suffer well? Are we going to give the culture what it wants? Are we going to submit to the culture? Or are we going to stand against the culture, but as you and I already know, stand against it redemptively with the cross of Christ always representing him? Dr. Erwin Lutzer says Christians can no longer stay silent about the divide between the Bible's truth and the world's lies. Next. I am so glad you join us today. James Robinson, Betty and I are thrilled always that we get to be together in the, in the family room to hear the Father. One of the people that influenced my life greatly when I was a teenager, after I was called to preach, was D.L. Moody. And he literally took two continents in his hands and shook them both with the power of God as he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because two women asked him and said, you, you need something. And, and indeed he did. And it was the fullness of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, not discussing the Holy Spirit, experience the power of the Spirit. Well, D.L. Moody is a hero to me, as were many of the great leaders in the past and the present. Well, Moody Church is one of the greatest examples to me. I can't tell you how proud I am of the legacy of D.L. Moody and Moody Church and the pastor that was there for 30 years plus uh, was Erwin Lutzer. And he became like one of my heroes. I'm holding a book. He's been here with many books. He's been coming for many years since he was pastor there. And he's been re retired from that church for a while. He never retired. <laughs> but here's a new book, No Reason to Hide, and standing for Christ in a collapsing culture. Betty, have you ever thought a culture could collapse so miserably? Mm -hmm. It doesn't even look possible, it, does it? I never thought I'd live to see where we are right now. It's very sad and very dangerous. And the church really has to step up right now and wake up to what's going on. The only way you overcome the power, the deadly, deceptive, destructive force of the gates of hell is the body of Christ. That's the only way. No other way. No one understands any better than Erwin Lutzer. So when he's looking at this collapsing culture, where insan insanity is ruling, it's worse than any Pharaoh or Caesar or any president or any party. It is total insanity. We've literally lost our minds and our way. And there's only one hope, and I believe this pastor, Erwin, Dr. Lutzer. I believe that God sent you here a long time ago. I think you'd agree he sent me. And in many ways, we've been walking together. Why did you write this book right now at this point in your life? And by the way, we're getting a little older. You do know that, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh-huh. One year at a time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, James, I turned 81 recently, and I love to tell people the good thing about old age is it doesn't last very long. <laughs> so let's be encouraged, okay? But in answer to your question, what I did is I looked at the pressure points that the church is facing today. And one of the points that I make is that the church needs to think through how to respond what is happening, and Betty, as you said, happening very quickly. So the book deals, and if I might just list a couple of topics, and then you can take the conversation wherever you like, but it deals with such thing as collective demonization, where you need to go along with the culture else you won't get a job. I give many examples of that and how the cancel culture works. But more than that, even things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is intended to help minorities, I point out why it actually doesn't help because it always puts us in oppositional terms. And by the way, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the answer to these kinds of racial issues. And I hope we get a chance to talk about that. And then from there on, I discuss issues such as what should parents say if their child comes home and says, you know, mom and dad, I think I'm trans. How do parents relate to that? And then one of the most interesting chapters I think has to do with propaganda, the submission of the church oftentimes to the culture. I discuss that and then very quickly, Issues even regarding the end times, the unity and the globalism of the world, particularly 
brought on because of COVID. But here's the heart that I want people to understand. I wrote this book because we as churches and as Christians need to always engage the culture very redemptively. We lead with the cross. We lead with the gospel. But that doesn't mean that we are uninvolved. I make the point in the first chapter that evil never retreats on its own. It only retreats when it is confronted by a greater power. And Betty, you and I and James, we know that that power is the cross of Christ. It is the power of the gospel. And you know where most of the church is today? Where? John chapter 20. The disciples are gathered in the upper room the doors being locked (laughs) for fear, okay? But you know what happens? Jesus appears and everything (laughs) changes. So we must understand that uh, we have Jesus, but the culture is collapsing. And so what I'm trying to do is to help Christians say, how do we think through these issues and respond biblically? You know, I felt like I heard the Lord just kind of whisper, and by the way, uh, Jesus can get in any locked room. He can get in any place. There's no barrier he can't penetrate. There's no barrier that prayer can't penetrate. There's no wall that love can't lift us above. There's no dividing wall that can keep us apart in the power of that unconditional redemptive love you talked about. If we're going to preach the Word of God, which is all you talk about, God's Word. If we're going to preach that Word, we've got to preach it with actions, not just words, or it becomes so much noise. But if we preach that Word, it has a penetrating effect. It has an illuminating effect. It is radiant. It exposes danger and evil and the way to life and joy and peace. Everything we're looking for that you can't find outside of God's truth, His Word, His Son, Jesus. Does that make sense? It makes sense. But let me even give you an example of that. Let's talk about one of the controversial issues of our culture, namely the racial issue. Critical race theory keeps dividing us so that we see one another in oppositional terms. And we could expound on that. But think of this verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, where the Apostle Paul says, In Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, Scythian, barbarians, but Christ is all and in all. Now, Here's what's very important. By the way, is he in Baptist and Pentecostals possibly? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the way you've asked the question, I think you've already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he is. <laughs> so the point is that uh, this doesn't mean that they lose their ethnicities. He's not saying that Greeks become Jews and Jews become Greeks and Scythians become barbarians. But there is a transcendent unity that is brought about. And to put it as clearly as I can, critical race theory continues to pull apart what Jesus died to bring together. So we must understand here, we're facing issues in our culture for which the church and the Bible has the answer. And uh, we need to be able to proclaim that with a sense of uh, conviction and clarity so that people understand what the Bible has to say about these controversial issues. You know, you said that uh, you wanted me to, to ask questions. And care. I want you to keep doing what you're doing. It doesn't get any better. Moody Church, y'all ever miss this guy? I, I mean, I understand you got absolutely the best and the greatest, but y'all ever miss this guy? You know what you did when you were moved from Moody Church? You just really, in a sense, you were sent to the church the whole church, to help the church get whole, get well, get suited up in Jesus. And by the way, in the last days, I ain't weary of hearing what the devil's going to do. I'm pretty tired of it. I still want to know what salt does. I still want to know what light does in the darkest time. I still want to understand Paul's instruction to Timothy that in the face of all this hell and this deception and this dissension and this, and I want you to talk about this reset, so to speak, I believe that we can pierce that darkness 
I, I, I was talking to uh, Philip Yancey about the gates of hell. The only power I said on this earth, according to Jesus, that can push back, tear down, affect the adverse effect of the gates of hell is the body of Christ. They're not to prevail. So why do we allow them to prevail? Well, he said to me, gates don't move. They just hold people captive. <laughs> you okay. got to storm the gates. And I'm looking at Philip, and I just gave him a high five. Of course, I said, that's you, Philip. You just, you're right. But we can storm the intentions of the devil. We can be overcomers. We can be more than conquerors in the fears of time. We don't have to give our marriage to the devil. We don't have to give our family to the devil. We don't even have to give our schools or our community to the devil. Does it make sense that we could take back some of the fields that we've allowed the pestilence to grow up in, get the flocks back in the shelter that we've turned over to the birds of prey and the wolves and the lions and the bears? Uh, am, I, am I just wasting time to talk about the fact that we might overcome the enemy's intentions in the last days? Well, you know, how that's all going to turn out, we're going to find out, of course, the way the Bible predicts various things are going to happen. But here's what we need to emphasize. Even this book that we're discussing today, I wrote it not so much to reclaim the culture because the culture is going its way. I did it to reclaim the church mm -hmm. because what's happening is the church is submitting to the culture. Mm -hmm. There are three different kinds of churches. One is a complacent church, which may oppose the culture, but say nothing about the culture and live in its own little bubble. Then there are also courageous churches which stand against the culture, and that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. But the other kind of church is the complicit church, which gives the culture everything that the culture wants. Mm -hmm. Whatever the culture wants, we'll give you. By the way, they're now demanding it. Yes. They're enforcing yes. it in the law. Yes, you absolutely. were talking about a while ago, you might not be able to get a job. You yep. might not be able to keep your job if you don't do what they say. Exactly. Exactly. Many different illustrations of this where, it, let me put it to you very clearly. It used to be that darkness here in America was optional. <laughs> Today, darkness is being imposed upon us yeah, right. legally, culturally. Yeah, I talk about cultural streams in, uh, you know, such things that we have in the media, but also in business, in our schools. By the way, I have a chapter in the book about uh, our public school system. Mm -hmm. James and Betty, it is horrible. So the question is this, that's why the last chapter of my book deals with rethinking what suffering for Christ means. James, we need to rethink this, and I'll tell you why. The average American believes this, that if we just had the right government, we'd always be able to have our freedoms, we'd always be able to have our prosperity, and we'd go on our way rejoicing. You can have perfect laws, imperfect hearts, we'll break them. Yes, exactly. But here's the point. We have to rethink persecution because it is actually a badge of honor. It positions us for a new kind of witness. This has been proven throughout it. The New Testament and Church. And I want to shout this from the housetops. And by the way, the way you shout encourages me to <laughs> shout too. Keep it up, buddy. <laughs> All right, like this. <laughs> Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute yeah. you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For so persecuted they the prophets shall be that were before you, and your reward shall be great. So <laughs> What we have to do is to rethink that. How about this? Philippians chapter 1. For you it is given for the cause of Christ not only to believe on him. My, we love that. Oh, I love to believe on Jesus. But the rest of the verse says to suffer for his name. Yeah. So the question is, are we going to suffer well? Are we going to give the culture what it wants? Are we going to submit to the culture? Or are we going to stand against the culture, but as you and I already know, stand against it redemptively with the cross of Christ, always representing him, always attempting with all that we have to make Jesus look good, but at the same time realize that there's a culture out there that is coming against yep. us and we have to stand against it. And the key to it to me is we can do all of this, not to lay down and let the enemy walk all over us. We can stand strong, but do it in the love of Christ. 
and it makes the difference. We can, we can show strength, but strength from God. We can show people that you don't just have to give in Right. It's because right. you're such a nice person. <laughs> and not only that, uh, Betty, but we can also show them that when they get pushed back, it may indeed be a sign of honor. Yes. You know, Jesus said, the world hates me, it's going to hate you. The question is, how are we going to respond? Are we going to buckle? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to stand firm and say, you know, I'm living for eternity and not time. I don't have to win in this world mm -hmm. to win in the life to come. And that's why the Bible talks about overcomers, mm -hmm. which we all can be in the midst of a collapsing culture, to use a mm -hmm. phrase that occurs on this book. So, You know, what I really believe is that if the church would really become an answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, where we come together in a supernatural unity shaped by the power of the Word of God in relationship with the Father as Jesus is and with one another in love, I believe that we would see the greatest in gathering in the history of the world. I honestly believe if the world could see the living Jesus in his body, where the family of God and the body of Christ actually look like Christ, I think people would run to that Father to that family to be a member of that body. And I think it'd be the greatest harvest in the history of the world. I don't think it'd just be millions. I think billions, if they see that Jesus, will come to him. And if we see the church adorned in his glory before he comes in glory, I think there'd be the greatest move of God in the history of the world. Now, I want you to know, there isn't a man on the planet, and I do know a lot of great Christians and a lot of great leaders that I respected him more than you. And you are gifted beyond words. I am totally captivated by you. I count, it, I count it an honor to be loved by you. Thank you. To be appreciated by, Thank you. by you. But listen to me. I want us to always be a team inspiring the body of Christ to come together in supernatural unity. Well, with regard to your comments about me, remember this. I have nothing and done nothing that I have not first received. <laughs> it's all of God. Yeah. I, I take totally. no credit 100%. for it. There's no, there's no connection between my upbringing in Canada on a farm and the privileges that I've had. <laughs> Father, thank you for this man. Thank you. Are you not glad that you watched Life Today and heard this? By the way, I'm going to be talking to him. I, I hope really uh, until the end and Jesus comes on the stream as often as I can, stream.org, because I'm trying to bring together the greatest, diverse, brilliant minds like our founders who will speak transforming truth unwaveringly in unconditional redemptive love, which he's full of. Um, Dr. Lutzer, we love putting God's arms around the people he extended his arms to die for. And the least of these, the most overlooked, he says, when you notice them, it's really interesting you say, it's the sheep, the ones I say are sheep, who do this. And I believe so many of our viewers who really know the shepherd love to put his arms around the overlook, the least of these. Well, we're going to show you some of those right now. Now, you remember this. You are the answer to the prayers that are being prayed in behalf of these who are suffering. You're the answer to that prayer. You're the miracle. Yes, you are. You're the one that sends the gospel, not in word only, but in demonstration. Watch closely and prayerfully. So we're here in rural Angola, and we've been talking to you about the, the drought that has ravaged this area. Not a one-year drought, not a two-year drought, five years of drought. Five years they've not had enough rainfall to grow a single crop. If you look here, you'll, you'll see that what's left of this farm is just dry remnants of a crop that used to be. How has the drought affected your ability to, the lack of rain affected your ability to be able to farm? A falta de chuva, primeiro, essa seca que nós cultivamos, todo o milho mesmo secou, não colhemos mesmo nada. Assim, tem já que fechar a porta para dormir, para as crianças não saírem, senão vai nos vizinhos e pedir comida. Tem que dormir cedo. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Mom. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. It's 
wrong. Sam, I'm sorry, mommy. I know that she would provide for her children. Give her half a chance. Just give her the rain that she needs and she will she'll cultivate that land. She will work her, herself as hard as she has to work to provide for those children. But it never rains anymore, is what she said. Five years of drought. I hope you feel like I do. And if you do, then I'm asking you to please say yes. I'm going to be a part of bringing food and changing this situation for this mother for her child so that she doesn't have to close the door early anymore before they go to bed hungry. You know, Esau, your dad left us, Peter, uh, a few years ago, four years ago. And I promise you, he's proud to see you reaching out and putting God's loving arms around them. Help us, I love you, Esau. I, uh, Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for helping us put loving arms of God around so many starving children in your, on your continent as you've asked us to. Betty, we need a miracle here at the end of the year. Um, you do get special blessing for year-end gifts. You know that. And I pray you'll take advantage of every tax advantage you're given because so much of our tax dollars is very questionable the way it's used. It's not used with wisdom and compassion. You never solve a problem by throwing money at it. You'll ruin a child throwing money at him without accountability and responsibility. You can actually be funding a, a monster. You don't do that, but we've allowed that to happen. Not in missions. You have a compassion connection. You have a love connection. You have a teaching, accountability, and responsibility. We actually, when we get them healthy, baby, we start feeding them in schools to keep them going to schools. And you do, that's what love does. That's what God's love does. And his love doesn't fail. So you are saving lives, changing lives. Would you right now here is a very special gift. Could you help us feed 10 children for the next month? It's $100. Where could you better put $100? Thirty dollars feeds three. Fifty feeds five. Could you possibly feed a hundred? Father, I know at the end of the year sometimes people think, "Wow, I need to catch up on tithing. I need to catch up on my giving." But Lord, where better could we put money than lives? Life now and life eternally with Jesus. Please bless this. Would you right now? Go get a bank card. If you ever want to use a check, make the check to life. But call us and tell us you're putting it in the mail. We need to know that. Would you do that? I can promise you, Betty and I will be sending a year-end gift. And we have been faithfully sharing the gospel through life outreach since we started doing missions and evangelism. And we have been tithing since we started dating and beyond. Would you please right now make the best gift you can? You're giving life. We've got some gifts to send you to bless you, but you're giving the greatest gift. Please get your bike card. Use it like a check. Dial that number. Go online and make the gift God puts on your heart. Thank you so much. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering and facing severe malnutrition. Lack of rainfall and severe drought has led to one of the deadliest food crises in 40 years. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Through Life's Mission Feeding Outreach, your gift of love can be an answer to prayer for a hurting and hungry child in their time of need. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, 50 or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the Life Planner. Bound in soft-touch leather, this planner will help you in your daily walk with space for you to record your appointments, goals, inspirational notes, and prayers. With your gift of $100 or more, please request a scripture pen set, perfect companions to the Life Planner, 
These beautiful wooden pens are inscribed with scripture references to keep your heart focused on God's plans for you. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Let the Children Come. This beautiful bronze is a reminder to care for children around the world in both word and deed. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I'm so glad that you could join us today because today is a joyous day. Why? Because we're here in a remote village in Angola where the food that is going into this bowl is literally delivering life to each and every one of these children. And that's why you can sense the joy. You can sense the life that's here. But here's the reality. We're reaching this village. But there are many villages around here where children are in far worse condition because mission feeding has not reached their village. And what that means is we're not able to provide life. You say, what do we do? How do we bring this life to those villages? Well, we're here. We've got our staff in place. We're ready to reach those villages. We know who they are and we know what their needs are, but we cannot do it without you unless you're prepared to open your hearts and to say, I'll do what I can do today to bring this life, this joy to the villages where mission feeding isn't right now, where lives are not being saved. Please give the gift of life. Give a gift to mission feeding because mission feeding saves lives. Lives. Dial that number, get online, give the very best gift that you can give. Give the gift of food, give the gift of life. Yeah, I, I want to say thank you. And I want to say this to you. You make any gift to feed a child, to share love, and you want Dr. Lutcher's book, boy, you can't go wrong getting it. Betty, don't you believe this truth is transforming? Absolutely, I know it is. It is amazing what this transforming truth will do in your life. So as you share love and you say, I need to know how I can have an effect and not hide, mm -hmm. but be a light that cannot be hidden. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lutzer, I love you very, very much. And you and I are going to be close now through eternity. Thank you. I love you, buddy. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you so much for watching life today and especially for sharing life. Tomorrow on Life Today, James, Betty, Randy, and Sheila share some exciting news in a special program along with a surprise guest. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.